The BRICS group of countries has begun meeting in South Africa. What's on the agenda at this historic summit? Thailand saw a day of dramatic political developments. It got a new prime minister while a former prime minister from the same party went to jail. What's happening? This is Daily Debrief. These are our stories for the day. And before you go any further, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. The 15th Leader Summit of the BRICS nations began in South Africa on Tuesday. This is the first in-person summit since 2019, and many have called it perhaps the most important one in the bloc's history. On the agenda is the question of expansion and other issues, including the role of what is called the BRICS Bank. We have with us Abdul for more details. Hi, Abdul. Thanks for joining us. Uh, now, Abdul, I know it's a little too early to talk about the outcome of the ongoing BRICS summit, but it's being called the most important BRICS summit held so far. So can you tell us the reasons why? Well, Pragya, of course, uh, that is the case. As we have discussed uh, in the beginning of our discussion, ever since the outbreak of the uh, Ukraine war, uh, the, the policies pursued by the rest, the Group 7 countries, the NATO or USA, or its European allies ha have made it very clear that they do not care about the uh, political differences uh, which different countries in the world have. They do not care about the, uh, uh, the differences in the approach which an individual country can have. And they want to dictate their terms on, on all the countries of the world, their allies or uh, uh, otherwise. I, and this policy, uh, if you see, uh, country after country has been have been asked by the U.S. and its European allies to basically follow its policy on Russia, put sanctions, follow the sanction, even if those sanctions are against their immediate economic interest. A large number of countries in Africa, for example, uh, were, were prevented uh, for a very long time to basically uh, get their basic food uh, imports from Russia. Uh, they were fearful that because of the sanctions there, they will have uh, repercussions to face. So it is, it is a few, of course, become it has become much more uh, clearer for the countries in the global south that uh, the, the West is uh, 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 basically, the West does not care about them. And they only want to pursue their own national interest at any cost, at the cost of third world countries and the developing countries or the countries of the global south. And that basically makes BRICS much more uh, uh, look much more inclusive, much more democratic, because it, it represents a set, set of countries. If you see, there is one side China, there is another side India, then there is a, a, a South Africa and Brazil. All of them are different, both in political terms and in econ economic terms. They have their different set of uh, uh, domestic politics, they have their domestic, the nature of their domestic politics is different. The nature of their uh, economic policies are quite different. It's different uh, from each other. And there is no attempt made by uh, uh, the dominant countries within the BRICS, economically stronger countries within the BRICS, militarily stronger countries within the BRICS to dictate their terms on their, its members. And so given this, uh, uh, the, given this contrast, uh, between the global, uh, uh, between the West and the BRICS countries. Of course, for the countries in the global uh, South, uh, BRICS has become much more important and much more acceptable. And that is why you see uh, uh, the number of countries uh, uh, showing their interest to become members of uh, BRICS at this juncture. So, of course, uh, the war in Ukraine has made BRICS much more uh, important and significant significant in global politics. Right, Abdul. Now, expansion, but that would come with opportunities as well as some challenges. Just walk us through some of those, please. Well, Pragya, it is, uh, just, it is too early to talk about the prospects uh, of uh, if BRICS decides to expand its membership. Uh, but the ch challenges are, of course, uh, quite obvious at this moment. There are uh, 
it is very difficult to handle a larger group of countries with the diverse uh, interests. Unlike the group of seven countries, uh, the Western countries, which represent a certain set of common, universal, uh, uh, uniform values, uh, the, the BRICS is already very diverse. There, is, uh, there are countries like India and there are countries like China, which completely, uh, when it comes to politics, represent two different uh, uh, cultures. So uh, th this is about the existing members. When we have more members in BRICS, uh, it will be much more diverse and much more uh, 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 versatile. And it will be difficult, it will be a, it will be a challenge for, uh, uh, to keep them all together on an on certain common agenda. So, of course, that is going to be a very uh, big challenge uh, in front of uh, uh, the BRICS if it decides to expand. Another major challenge would be uh, basically to kind of uh, create some kind of uh, coherence in uh, their policies uh, uh, when it comes to uh, dealing with the West or dealing with their common economic interests. The, the, the BRICS expanded, the BRICS, existing BRICS, by the way, is already again, uh, as I said before, apart from the democracy, apart from the political diversity it represents, uh, it also represents the economic uh, inequality. There is on the one side, there is China, which is the world's second largest economy. And on the other side, there is South Africa, which is one of the smaller economies in the global politics in, in, in the world. So if there are countries like, say, Algeria or Argentina becoming members of uh, uh, the BRICS, the, this particular gap between China on one side, uh, China and India on the other one side and other countries on the other, there will be a complete uh, a kind of economic uh, uh, inequality and that may uh, lead to some kind of uh, uh, challenges in future. One last thing, unlike in the West where the US is a hegemon and accepted by the rest of the uh, European countries, uh, the members of the Group 7, uh, and there is hardly any challenge to US leadership. Uh, the BRICS is much more democratic and it represents a much more uh, much more diversity of both in, it's in its political approach and its economic outlook. And that uh, and uh, there is no one country which basically is, is in a position or is willing to dictate terms on the other members of uh, that group. And how to, uh, in that particular context, how to make decisions fast and how to kind of take a common stance on uh, emerging global issues would be a challenge. So I think these are the things we can think of when we talk about the prospects and challenges uh, 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 of the BRICS in uh, uh, expanded BRICS. Uh, the prospects are quite clear, of course. Uh, Abdul, the last question, do you think that the forum like the BRICS has become more relevant considering the Ukraine war is on since last year? And how does it make a difference to the summit? Pragya, this summit, BRICS summit is called historic, is considered to be historical primarily because of the two reasons which are inter interrelated. Of course, the first is, uh, first set of reason is basically the larger polarization which is happening at this moment in the global politics. The West represented by the group of seven countries, which is considered to be declining in its uh, economic and uh, political power in the global politics, uh, is still trying to assert its, dom its domination through the, policy, through the policies of hegemony and domination. Uh, it is threatening sanctions, uh, asking countries to follow its policies vis-a-vis -vis Russia, uh, it's uh, and uh, basically trying to uh, uh, dictate terms to different countries and, and and the countries in the global south are primarily in the global south are no more interested in uh, for, uh, basically blindly following whatever uh, is told to them. So uh, if you see the second reason uh, uh, why it is called historic. Of course, if you see the number of countries which have, which have shown interest in becoming member of uh, uh, BRICS, 
had have shown uh, in fact officially applied for BRICS membership. A large number of these countries, uh, there are 23 countries which have officially applied to become members. There are 40 countries, these are the numbers, have expressed their interest in becoming uh, in the functioning of the BRICS and she see them see it as an alternative. Uh, there are 67 countries, by the way, which are participating in the ongoing conference, conference in Johannesburg. And all those these countries come from all different continents of the world and represent some of them have been very close allies in the past to the West, uh, whether it is Egypt, whether it is uh, Turkey, whether it is uh, uh, countries in uh, some of the countries in Africa, some of the countries in Latin America. Uh, so given this wider interest among the countries of the Global South to become members of the uh, BRICS, uh, BRIC ha BRIC, BRICS has BRIC, BRICS countries, primarily China, Russia, India, uh, Brazil and South Africa, they have to decide whether they really want to expand their membership and if they want to expand their membership, uh, how, how to uh, do it and uh, uh, what would be the challenges ahead uh, in doing so. So since this summit will decide this fundamental aspect of BRICS, uh, expanding its membership and making it much more uh, representative and much more global uh, 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 in its uh, uh, formation. Uh, this basically, the, this is the reason which makes this particular summit historic. August 22 was a dramatic day for Thailand, arguably one of the most dramatic in its political history. After weeks of uncertainty, the country has a new prime minister, real estate baron Sreta Thavisin, who is associated with the Fur Thai party. The man who founded that party, former Prime Minister Thaksin Shinawatra, returned to Thailand on the same day after 15 years in exile and he was promptly sent to jail. Thai came to power after forming an alliance with erstwhile rivals and ditching its earlier alliance partner, the Move Forward Party, which was the single biggest force in the lower house of parliament. To understand this strange situation, the ruling party's founder is in jail. We have with us Anish. Great. Anish, thanks very much for joining us. A big development in Thailand. Now, how did this government get cobbled together and what does it mean for Thailand? Well, uh, one thing that we need to understand is that this is very clearly uh, an attempted compromise by the Thai party, uh, which pretty much, I like the reasoning given by them, including some of the leaders who have, uh, you know, pledged to resign once the government, uh, then once the cabinet is formed, is that there was no other way for them. They're clearly showing a certain level of defeatism in the manner, because the system obviously allows uh, for the military appointed uh, senators, for those of our audience who do not know, the manner in which uh, things work in Thailand right now under the constitution that was uh, created by the junta itself. Uh, junta appointed senators pretty much also have a say in deciding the prime minister. So you need to have a combined majority in both the Senate and the House of Commons, or sorry, the House of Representatives. Uh, and that cre creates a situation where the 250 uh, odd members were almost entirely at this point appointed by the former junta, uh, pretty much decides, uh, like has the say in who becomes, a uh, who becomes a prime minister, no matter how much of a big majority you have in the House of Representatives. So despite the fact that a previous coalition, which pretty much existed of uh, mostly populist and you know, pro-democratic anti junta anti-militaristic anti-prior uh, parties uh, it did not really succeed primarily because they didn't have enough votes to surpass a combined majority of both houses now and they pretty much also had to uh, you know keep the move forward party which was the largest party that emerged out of the general election out of this entire political equation now it is going to be an official opposition once the cabinet is formed so this is a situation where the previous junta pretty much hasn't lost and complete power. They're pretty much back in the government in a new form uh, under a, a different umbrella. And that is the, that is the kind of uh, situation that we're seeing in Thailand right now, where, uh, and it's a very odd situation because some of them, like many of the people in Koei Thai, even the supporters were pretty much staunch opponents of the of military run government 
of the junta of prayut and uh, and pravit even like uh, the two leaders of two major parties that now will be part of the cabinet of the new upcoming cabinet under shrita so these kind of political equations is going to be very odd because we are looking at not just like a couple of years of small time rivalry that we see in normal electoral electoral democracies we're looking at violent rivalries that actually led to a bloody coup at several instances bloody repression uh, of the poet uh, supporters especially the red shirts as we uh, know today uh, who uh, campaign for a uh, democratization of the state so these people are now you know come by coming together in a very different kind of alliance that is never that was never seen before in pilot and so we need to uh, wait and see how this going this is going to work out because obviously the senate composition might change in uh, the next year or so and that there, there might be new political equations uh, we are also we also have a couple of cases against the current prime minister uh, who allegations at the very least of uh, corruption and uh, you know impropriety uh, during uh, because he's a realtor uh, he's a you know real a realty mogul real estate mogul so he pretty much has a couple of cases against him but that most of which came up very recently in the past week or so uh, very conveniently and so there is a pressure that has been kept against the government as well so a disqualification can uh, can be on the cards if the military finds that this government is straying too far away from their situation so there is a certain kind of you know a, a, you know a very tight grip that the military uh, the junta has on the current government and it is very apparent at the moment right now now anish also taksin is back he's in jail what are the chances what are the odds of some sort of a deal being struck over here uh well obviously taksin is back like uh, after uh, you know months of uh, back and forth on whether or not he's going to be back after his 15 year old exile uh, so now he's definitely back because he's confident that he might be out in a couple of days or maybe a couple of weeks even uh, uh right now there is uh, because he has already been handed down sentence uh, of a combined uh, sentence of about 8 years on charges of corruption and uh, you know associated charges of fraud uh, many of which at the time uh, when the charges happened he was not there to uh, you know, defend uh, and pretty much were done under a uh, junta ruled government and court system so uh, there were obviously doubts at the time about whether or not many of the uh, many of these charges were even uh, you know uh, had any kind of basis to begin with but the, nevertheless he has been handed down a sentence he is con uh, convicted he is found guilty uh, all of that happened in a very uh, you know in the, in the middle of a big fanfare uh, in uh, you know celebrating his uh, return and so it's a very odd kind of situation as i said it's just as odd as the government formation so very clearly he pretty much began like he right after he came out of the airport the first thing he did was uh, to bow before a portrait of the monarch and he pretty much pre uh, clearly setting the the lines the conditions of his return uh clearly showing that he's pretty much backing uh banking on the current coalition government to uh you know bail him out of jail uh it is quite likely that he will be sent into uh sent to a hospital under police supervision uh in maybe a, a 20, less than 24 hours of his being jailed and so there is this very tacit understanding that he's definitely going to be out in a few maybe give or take a few weeks and uh, not more than that he's going not going to be at custody after that so that is something that is uh, pretty much on the cards but definitely he is a card that uh, that might be used uh, by uh, the military junta at uh, various points and that can also uh, be grounds for like the grounds for dissolution of a party that does uh, that opposes the junta has always been quite shaky so there are multiple levers that the, mil uh, the military has against this current government uh Thaksin is one of them obviously Thaksin is going to be straight at Thaksin is definitely going to be another and obviously other cases and charges that can obviously be stretched uh in the constitutional court uh and that uh, is going to keep the pressure on and it, we are already looking at a situation where this this pressure is not going to go away anytime soon
So obviously this situation has created a, a, a problem for, and we need to talk about this as well, problem for supporters of the Poetai because a large number of them obviously very clearly had very clear convictions against the military government that preceded uh, this current government, not just the elected one, the so-called elected one under Prayut, but Prayut's coup government that has been in power since 2014. And these factors are definitely going to change. We are already seeing pledges of resignation. Uh, we are seeing uh, the chair of the party, Poetai party, uh, saying that he will resign once the cabinet is done. He's just there to, you know, smoothen the function, even though he was the one who actually uh, nominated Sreka in the parliament, he's going to resign uh, once everything is settled. Uh, we are already seeing the founder of Red Shirts, uh, the one group that was the civil society coalition that actually led the anti-coup protest in 2014 after the, uh, the coup was, uh, the coup happened and who were violently suppressed at the time. Uh, he will also be resigning from his position. We are also seeing former uh, legislators, maybe some current legislators as well, leaving the party. So there is this definite clear pressure that they are, like this is obviously part of this contradiction that the government will be facing. And we do not know how stable it will be in the next coming years. But, and that is something that even Move Forward Party and other, other people, other observers, other civil society activists have also pointed out that this does not really uh, offer you any promise of stability. It only offers you more significant control that the junta will have more insidious control over the current government. And that is something that can you know, uh, spiral into a different kind of crisis in the future as well. So this is something that we need to keep a tag on, obviously, and uh, we'll be reporting about it. But uh, at the current uh, moment, this sort of weird coalition is something that is definitely going to go down in history as something, uh, whether or not it's a mistake or not, we need to be see, but definitely something that will be part of Thailand's history of something that we are happening. All right, Anish, thanks very much for joining us. And that's all we have for today. Thanks very much for watching Daily Debrief. We will see you again on Wednesday. Our website, peoplesdispatch.org, and our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram accounts have more of our stories. Our YouTube channel has more updates and this show daily debrief. Remember to subscribe and thanks again for watching.